Hello, I am going to show you how to build your own open secure telephony network server. Um, I got some, some requests um, to do a screencast um, showing the whole process um, that is documented here uh, on this blog post. Um, it is a 12-step program, but I made it uh, 12 steps just to try and hit the 12 steps. Um, as sort of a joke. Um, it might take a little bit less than 12 steps, and I'm only going to cover the basics of getting uh, the server set up, um, booted, giving it a domain name, downloading the Chef cookbook, and running that cookbook to build FreeSwitch with a secured configuration. Uh, so, sounds simple enough, right? Um, so here we go. Uh, the first thing that you need to do is um, create an account with Amazon EC2. Um, you don't have to use EC2. Um, any hosting service will work. But since Amazon EC2 is the most popular hosting service, uh, I am going to do this demo with Amazon EC2. Um, the supported platform that I'm targeting is Ubuntu Precise. Uh, that's version 12.04. It is their long-term support, or LTS release, which means that they are committed to supporting it for some time. I forget exactly how long. Um, I think it's like four years or five years. Um, let's see what download means. Ubuntu server. Um, they have their own cloud infrastructure images. Um, we're not going to be using 12.10. Um, that is currently not a supported platform. Um, I think that 12.10 is called Quantal. Um, so yeah, long-term support is guaranteed for five years, not four years. Okay, cool. So if you set up the server now, uh, you can be guaranteed um, that uh, in 2017, it will, it will be supported by Canonical um, until 2017, which seems like quite a long time. Um, so yeah, I just searched for EBS images. You want an EBS image. Um, that's important. Uh, I won't go into the details of that here. Um, just it's important. You have a couple of other options. Um, look for EBS images. Ubuntu, precise. Um, here is one for 64-bit. Uh, I'm going to boot a 64-bit server here just for the demo's purposes so I could have more CPU and memory so it will build faster. Um, you can use a free uh, uh, tier. They have a full free tier um, that you'll see when I click launch. So this one here that says T1 Micro, uh, those cost no money to, to uh, operate. Um, it, you still pay for bandwidth, um, but the CPU is really inconsistent, um, especially when you're doing things like compiling software. Um, it could take significantly longer if you compile software on a micro instance. But if you don't care about that, go ahead, use the micro instance. I'm going to use a uh, M1 medium because it has, oh, they changed it. It only has one core. It used to have two cores. It has two elastic compute units, whatever. I'm going to do dual core, M1 large. Um, and availability zone um, doesn't really matter. I'm going to pick uh, C just because I know that that one uh, is one I've used before. Um, don't worry about this launch as EBS optimized instance. Um, that's if you want higher performance. Um, so you gotta continue. Um, then you're gonna go, uh, this kernel ID and RAM disk ID is loading. It doesn't really matter. Uh, you do not want monitoring. You do not want any user data, but things can get interesting. Um, if you start to use user data, if you're deploying a lot of these, um, once you get the hang of it, um, you can churn these things out like Lego blocks. Um, shutdown behavior is stop. You do not want terminate. Keep that default there. Um, leave everything else unchecked. You don't care about IAM. And click continue. Um, these are your storage volumes. Um, there's going to be a uh, 8 gig storage volume, um, which in this case is fine. Um, you, if you're operating a server, um, for, for a while, I think 8 gigs should be okay for you because the server itself doesn't really store much data. Um, but you can always adjust that size later. 
continue, give it a name. I'm going to call it demo and key pairs. Um, I have a key pair already made. Um, this is something that you should also do ahead of time um, is um, create a key pair and download it, the private key uh, to your desktop. Actually, you know what? I'm going to make a new key pair just for this demo. I'm going to name it OSTN demo. Um, so create and download my key pair. Um, I'm going to download it to somewhere temporary since this is not going to last for longer than this demonstration. Um, you see this file name, the default file name is fine. Um, you see all the other files in my temp directory which I have to clean out. Um, uh, so now I downloaded that key pair you can see down here. Um, it's probably going to try and access it. I shouldn't have clicked on that. Whatever, don't really care. Um, but uh, that key pair is important. Um, now security groups. Um, I have a couple of security groups predefined. Uh, this is my account that I, I do use um, for other things. I'm going to use the default security group. Um, I'll show you what that means uh, after the server is booted. gives you a little um, summary screen of all the stuff that you just said. Uh, don't worry about reading it too much. Um, you only will, you, all you care about is the uh, IP address after it's launched, which I'm going to do now. Um, so yeah, so now it's launching. Um, while it's launching, I'm going to go over to here and show you the second mm, important step, which is uh, DNS. You um, need your you need a DNS account. I'm using name.com. Um, I've also registered a domain called osthill.co, um, and uh, I'm going to use that for a demo. Uh, but since my server isn't finished booting yet, I don't have an IP address, so I can't do anything in the screen. Um, I just wanted to show you that this. I'm going to come back to the screen. Uh, you could use any registrar uh, you want. Name.com is all right. Um, I also like um, joker.com. Uh, I believe they're based in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, there's also a, a more popular one in, in uh, the States called GoDaddy, um, but I do not recommend them. GoDaddy is, um, is kind of shady. Um, they've had a history of selling people out in the past, like if you're hosting uh, content that's controversial, um, they, um, they don't have a good reputation for protecting your privacy. And since an open secure telephony network server is designed to protect your privacy, all services that you use, um, ideally, best practice should be ones that you know will protect your privacy. Um, all right, so I'm going to switch to terminal, and I'm going to go to my temp directory here, and I'm going to see if uh, Austin demo, that is in fact a file. Um, that's good. So I'm going to add this to my SSH key ring. Um, now, by default on OSX, which is the platform I'm giving this demo on, um, SSH agent is running. Um, that shouldn't be um, uh, uh, different on any mainstream platform right now. Um, you can check by, by saying SSH add L, and that will list your keys that are in your key ring. This key ring is running in the background. Um, you, um, this is the, one of the only ways to see what's in your key ring. Uh, so I'm going to add the uh, Austin demo key to my key ring by saying ssh-add stn demo. Um, oh, it's yelling at me. It's saying, oh no, the permissions are too permissive. Uh, it even tells you, see it says right here, um, that's what the permissions are. Uh, we want to make those permissions more restrictive. So we're going to go chmod600. Uh, that is not the number 600. That's 6 followed by a 0 followed by a 0. Each of the digits have a specific meaning. Um, just memorize this for now. Um, if you want to read about the meaning of those, um, you can do that uh, later. So I'm doing, going to chmod600 stn demo. Now I'll try and add it to my keyring. Identity added. Uh, I'm scrolling uh, up through my uh, terminal history with the up arrow. Um, so you can see that here is the Austin demo key. Great. So where are we now? Go back 
to the EC2 management console. And where it says instances, these are my running instances. I only have one uh, right now called Austin Demo. That's the one I just booted. And here you have um, a domain name. Uh, now the domain name uh, is interesting because it also contains the IP address, the public IP address. Um, so we're going to copy that. And um, what you want to do is uh, run this utility called dig, dig, and then paste the domain name. So what this says right here is this is the IP address for this domain name. You can see that 5454. 234, 234, 84, 237, and so on. That is the, the IP address, which is contained in the, in the domain name. So it's kind of a shortcut if you don't want to run dig. Um, I usually uh, run dig just because it does a real DNS query out on the internet, and it assures you that that is, in fact, an IP address. So since I have that IP address, I'm going to go to my DNS management. I'm going to create an A record, which is the default uh, main.com. I'm going to call it OSTN, um, and I'm going to paste in that IP address. TTL 300, 300 seconds. Um, that's a good, a sensible default. That means that the name will uh, update every 300 seconds. So if you make a change in here, um, it will not take effect immediately. It will take 300 seconds um, for all the other computers on the internet uh, to get that name. Um, so I added the record. I don't think I have to save anything after that. Um, so we can check by copying this text, austin.usto.co. Keep in mind that your names will be different than mine. Um, and I can do run dig again on that name. And lo and behold, um, that is, in fact, what we just set. Awesome. So we have a domain name. We know the IP address. We have a key pair generated, which means we can log into the server. Um, so let's try and do that. I'm going to use SSH again. SSH, I'm going to SSH as the Ubuntu user, which is the default user. Um, and that user uh, is unprivileged, but has full uh, pseudo privileges, which means it can become root. Uh, and I will be working as root. Dot, dot, oh, and it's going to say, oh, I, the authenticity of the host can't be established, which is fine, because um, we are, in fact, the operators of this host, so uh, we don't really care um, who else is operating it, because no one else is. Um, if you are in a situation where you are unsure of who is operating that server, you could um, you could verify this, this, um, this fingerprint. Um, from the, uh, the operator. Um, and I mean, the oper when I say operator, I mean a real living person. Um, but typically, that's not really uh, that common of a process um, unless you have servers with lots of administrators. Um, but in this case, you are the administrator. Awesome. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to become root. I'm going to type sudo i. And, and now I'm going to type who am I? Oh, look, it says that I'm root. That is what I want. Uh, working as root is a practice that is discouraged. Um, I do not discourage it. All, uh, all I do is say, be careful, because you could destroy your whole computer if you make a mistake. So check your keystrokes carefully, and don't type anything like that, bad. If I hit enter, that would have been, would have been very bad. Um, but I didn't hit enter, so that's fine. Um, clear the screen. Um, so the next step um, is to download the Chef Cookbook. Um, this is the URL uh, for the Chef Cookbook. Um, actually, this is the URL to the Guardian Project's collection of cookbooks uh, that we are developing and maintaining. Um, my uh, the, the the word twelve tones there because that's my. Um, um, that's my consulting business, my development business. Um, but uh, the Guardian Project is sponsoring this particular um, OSTN project. Um, so I'm hosting these cookbooks under there. Um, so I clicked on cookbooks. Uh, we, um, all we care about right now is free switch. 
Um, there's some other cookbooks in here in various uh, states of development. Not all of them will do anything interesting. Uh, the Free Switch cookbook does do some pretty interesting stuff, and that's the only one we care about. So here's some uh, documentation about what's going on, um, and um, which is what I'm working you through. Um, so all we care about right here is the usage. Um, so we're going to install some base dependencies just to be certain. All we need is curl and git. Those are the only two base dependencies. I'm going to paste those in, and let's see. All right, so git is not installed by default, um, so that's good. It looks like curl is on this release of Ubuntu. That's nice. I'm using apt git to install the packages, which is the Ubuntu package manager. It goes on the internet and grabs those packages from the official Ubuntu archive. Whoops. <laughs> which you can see right here, um, downloads them, and installs them. You don't have to worry about anything else. Um, cool. So we have git. Now I am going to um, install Chef. Chef is the framework for automating servers that I chose to write this cookbook with. Um, it is a really cool, really cool framework developed by a company called OpsCode. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a good kind of a Swiss army knife for automating things that um, otherwise would take a lot of time and be kind of boring. Um, so I'm going to uh, paste this in. I like to dis discourage kind of copy and paste uh, programming. I'm going to delete that just for illustration's sake. Um, that was a pipe to bash. Um, so what, what this is, is it's a script. I, I didn't write it. It's what, um, it's what Ubuntu wrote. Um, um, or sorry, it's what OpsCode wrote to install Chef. Um, I'm going to get rid of the word sudo there because I'm already root. Um, and just pipe it to bash. So it's saying take that script, send its output through this pipe, um, which is signified, symbolized by a vertical bar, and um, pipe it to bash, which is uh, the name of the shell. So literally execute it. Download code off the internet and execute it as a root. Dangerous stuff, but we're going to do it because I've done this many times and we can trust ops code to not do bad things to your computer. Um, so it looks like it installed Chef, um, it installed the package. Thank you for installing Chef. Yeah, that was pretty darn easy. Um, oh, so my instructions, um, I tell you to become root at, uh, later on. Um, I, I, you could do it either way um, for this demonstration. I'm just going to stick as a root. So now I'm going to type cd squiggly line or tilde. Let's go to the home directory just to make sure in case you uh, got sidetracked and did some other stuff before you uh, typed these commands in. Just make sure you're at your home directory because on the other, the following commands, assume that you are there. So now I'm going to, I'm going to use, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to use git clone, um, which will take this URL, it will make a clone, um, fancy word for copy, um, to this server. Now, um, remember, just um, this terminal is a window into another computer. This is not the computer that um, that I am um, working on. I'm recording the screencast on. Um, just, just to to um, make it clear that we are working on a server which is hosted elsewhere in this case, an Amazon DEC2. So I'm going to clone that. Fortunately, it's a pretty small collection of files, so it's very fast. Um, and now I'm going to go copy this um, and paste that and go into the directory, uh, the config directory. Um, now, just for illustrations purposes, this config um, contains some JSON. It's pretty simple. It just says, Add the recipe called free switch to the run list. Um, I'm using a text editor called Vim. Uh, you won't need to edit this if all you want to do is install free switch. Um, as this cookbook collection gets more uh, evolved or, or uh, complicated and I start adding more cookbooks, um, you can do some interesting things with them by uh, chaining together uh, cookbooks into more complicated run lists. But in this case, everything is self contained in the free switch cookbook. 
we can just run it as is. Um, I'm going to run chef solo. That's what this line is. Chef solo is a way to run chef in place, um, an alternative architecture for, for chef. If you have a larger collection of servers, if you're not just operating one server, but many, um, is to run a chef server, which is a centralized location to hold all of your um, other servers, uh, configuration data, package lists, all the stuff that makes those servers do interesting things rather than just sit there doing nothing. Um, so um, we don't care about that right now. Um, we care about just running Chef Solo, um, which is going to take a small configuration. Um, I'm not going to show you this configuration. Leave that as an exercise to the user if you care. Um, nothing much interesting in there. Just I think it sets some directories. Um, and then it's passing an option, which is that configuration uh, in the JSON format. Um, that all it does is tells it to run the free switch cookbook, um, which is located in the directory that we just downloaded in this Chef 12 tone um, <coughs> repository. Uh, so here we go. This is going to take a while, so I may have to pause it. Um, and uh, I'm going to make my terminal bigger so you can see all of the wonderful log output. Um, you can see that uh, Chef has done some interesting things. Oh no, I'm gonna pause. I'm gonna. I hit Control C. I'm gonna stop it. Um, I forgot an important step: setting the host name. Right. Uh, this step is documented here under the requirements in big capital letters that say this is crucial. Um, the reason that this is crucial is because the Chef cookbook depends on your fully qualified domain name, which is a domain name that we set over here. This is your fully qualified domain name. Well, actually, this is my fully qualified domain name. Yours will look different, and your IP address will also be different, because it will be it will belong to you, not me. Um, so uh, the reason that this is written down and not part of the cookbook is because every platform makes this process uh, or, or implements this process differently, uh, which makes it very difficult to standardize it into a script. Um, so, I am going to show you the best practice that I've found for Ubuntu systems for setting the host name. Um, so, this is where you're going to need to learn how to use a text editor if you don't already know one. I like Vim. It's installed by default. I'm going to open the file called slash etsy slash host name. Typing and talking at the same time is hilarious. And in here, uh, I'm going to delete this whole line go into insert mode and type in ostn.ostl.co. That's a fully qualified domain name. Write quit, which writes the file out, quits the editor. I'm also going to go into etsy hosts, which is a, yet, a, yet another file. Um, you'll see this first line here. Keep that line, very important. Um, and since I have my DNS info up, I'm going to copy the IP address paste it into there, hit the tab, copy the domain name, paste it after the tab, exit insert mode, write and quit. You see when I say write and quit, that's what I type, WQ, down there. And that's done. The way to load in that configuration, um, I believe I've documented here as well. Sometimes I forget how to do it. Um, do, do, do. I think the easiest way is to uh, log out, log back in, hostname dash f. Uh, oh, lies, lies and deceit. Let's log in again. I just logged out. Um, I had to log out of two shells because I switched to a root shell. Um, I don't have to here. Hostname dash f. Oh, Ubuntu, you're not being nice to me. Why didn't it keep my host name? See, this process is different. Um, I usually do this process in Debian, but in this case, I'm doing it on Ubuntu, um, which makes it different. So let's see. I believe I remember hostname dash capital F, and then Etsy hostname. I believe that's how I load in the new hostname configuration. Hostname dash F. Oh, look at that. Different. Now it is austin.austel.co rather than this big string of stuff that ends in .ec2.internal. Important, important stuff. Um, 
if we were, were to leave out this hostname step, uh, we would have a uh, free switch server um, at a domain name which I have just selected, which is a domain name that is private to Amazon EC2, which means that other users on the internet could not connect to your server, which defeats the purpose of setting up a server. Why did they choose to do that? I don't know. Um, I'll leave that for a more philosophical discussion later. Um, all we need to know is that our hostname is all good. Um, and I'm going to just stay consistent and keep doing my little copy and paste stuff um, rather than typing everything out myself, even though I've done this enough times to memorize it. Um, rerun Chef Solo. One of the really cool things about Chef is um, you can uh, do things like I did, um, and we get an exception. Oh no, this demo is not working out the way that I expected it to. Um, it looks like there is um, there's no package called G++. Um, I don't believe you. I think you're wrong. G++ is uh, the GNU C++ compiler, uh, which is part of the GNU C compiler, which is a base dependency for this operating system. Uh, I means. Um, Trying to install that. Well, so you're having some live debugging. Um, it looks like it's trying to do it. Well, let's run app to get update to try and update our package repository. Perhaps that didn't happen. Maybe there's an older version of G++ um, 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 on this computer when uh, Ubuntu has, has released a newer version. Uh, that's probably what happened. Uh, happen, scroll up. And shift solo again, see what happens. Uh, we've updated our package list. Looks like that's what the issue was. Um, Chef was not smart enough to find out this inconsistency and adjust itself. Um, it assumes that the list of packages that were on this server were in fact the correct packages um, and acted with that knowledge. Um, that was obviously wrong. So that's what it did. Um, but um, what I was saying before, what's cool about Chef is um, um, they, um, they've developed it with this idea um, that, uh, of, um, of like repeatability, um, where, whereas um, um, if you have an a instruction and it either fails, or in my case, you pause it. Actually, we saw both me, um, my uh, manual intervention of stopping Chef from running. Um, and setting the host name, and also an exception that was thrown um, because of the package database. So you saw both Chef bailing on its own and me bailing Chef, um, yet it didn't matter either of those times because Chef just picks up right where it left off. It doesn't repeat any of the work it's already done. Uh, the fancy pretentious term for this is idempotent, uh, and um, it comes from mathematics, so that means that it must be smart. So if you use that word um, um, in, in public, um, you can probably get some, some cred, but uh, uh, make sure you actually know what it means, because you might be in the company of someone uh, who uh, is a mathematician, and, and they might want to talk to you about idempotency or something like that. Um, all you have to know uh, in the context of Chef is that it makes Chef uh, continue to fail the same way if it fails at all until you intervene and do something different, um, um, or make a change on the server, change the state of the server, and then run Chef again. Um, it will um, uh, um, act with that new information um, and possibly do something different. Um, so now this is gonna take, uh, take a while, so I'm probably gonna pause it here um, and wait for this to conclude. Uh, it's compiling free switch. Um, uh, before I pause it, uh, I'll explain why I'm compiling FreeSwitch. Um, this is because uh, FreeSwitch uh, has a really active development community. Um, its source code changes uh, quite frequently. And in this case, for a lot of the advanced security features, um, the uh, current development uh, branch of FreeSwitch um, does not, is incompatible 
with, uh, with OSTN. Um, and uh, I've been, um, I've been uh, following you know, that community for a while, and there may have been some changes in the last month or so. Um, I haven't tested them yet. Um, I will test them, but right now free, I'm using an older version of FreeSwitch that I've confirmed works uh, with what's called ZRTP pass-through mode. Um, that means that all of the audio data, um, which will be encrypted, um, is uh, passing through the server. The server's proxying it without decrypting it. So it's just going through the server. Um, the server's not touching that data other than passing it right back out the other end. Uh, that's what we want. We don't want a server that alters the audio content, which uh, that would make our uh, security uh, insecure, um, and it would make our privacy not private. So we would lose both of the goals that we're trying to achieve with a secure and private uh, telephone system. Um, so yeah, I'm going I'm to pause it there. Um, start back up when uh, the chef run is finished, um, or if there are any errors, I'll start it back up and show you what those errors are and possibly how to fix them. Um, and I'll be back in a little bit.